Hello YouTubers and RV fans, today on the Paddy Wagon we're going to talk about how to manage an emergency situation when you're on the road or how to prepare to get on the road if you have a chronic illness and you take medications or you need to see the physician frequently. So stay tuned, today's Paddy Wagon is going to be pretty important. Okay, so let's talk to those people that are preparing to get on the road but are a little bit concerned because they have a chronic medical condition and they're fearful that getting on the road is going to preclude them from seeing their doctor or receiving the best type of medical care they can get. Now, this is a very personal decision. Uh, anyone who decides to get on the road and live in an RV and travel the country, it's a decision that they really have to make on their own. Um, certainly, it's not something that I can say, oh, just get out there and do it, because there's a lot of steps that have to be taken to be sure that you're well prepared to being on the road with a chronic illness. But there's a couple of tips that I want to give you today that maybe will help you um, be less fearful about it and perhaps um, embrace the idea a little bit more. Remember, um, and I think there's a number of our viewers that say that we're not promised tomorrow and we're not. And what we need to do is really face the challenges that we have and realize our dreams. If getting on the road is one of your dreams, then you should consider ways to do it. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is talking with your physician. Um, if you're interested in getting on the road, one of the first things that I would encourage you to do is to sit down and meet with your doctor. Go over what your issues are with the physician. Find out from the doctor a couple of things. Number one, can you get prescription medications renewed more frequently than once a month or once every couple of months? If the doctor is willing to give you routine uh, general medications, um, and renew them um, up to at least six months and that gives you some flexibility to travel the country. Number two, finding alternate physicians to see when you're on the road. Do you have a, a health insurance plan that will give you national coverage? Um, if you are retired and over the age of 65, do you have Medicare? Do you have a Medicare supplement? These types of insurance policies will help to assure that you can schedule an appointment with a doctor in the city that you're in. If you are, for example, if you're living in Florida right now and you decide that you want to travel to Quartzsite um, and along the way you need to see a doctor, it's very important that you be able to stop, schedule an appointment, and go see a physician. Or go see a healthcare primary care provider that's going to be able to help meet your issues. Now remember something, and this is really very important. There's hospitals across the country. So if you run into an emergent situation, when you're on the road, your home has wheels. You pull into a hospital, you go into the emergency room, and voila, you get taken care of. That's how it works. So if you have a lot of fear about the idea of traveling, you need to break those fears down into what your primary concerns are. So today, get a piece of paper and write out what your list of fears are and what your concerns are relating to your chronic medical condition. When you have that list complete, schedule your appointment with your physician and talk with your physician about ways in which you can travel and still meet your health care obligations, whether that be a routine visit. Let's take, for example, you have chronic atrial fibrillation, and maybe you're taking Coumadin. So for those that are taking Coumadin, you know that you have to have your INR drawn every week. So in order for you to get on the road, you need to know about the options of where you can go and have your blood tested so that you can get an accurate INR reading. Perhaps you're stable on your Coumadin and or maybe the doctor has prescribed you on a new type, some type of um, uh, anticoagulant that's going to um, not require that type of intense monitoring that Coumadin does. There's a number of new drugs on the market. So again, meeting with your physician and saying, is there anything I can take that's not going to require me to go to the doctor every week to have my blood tested? Now if the doctor says no, you have to stay on Coumadin, 
that's fine. There are Coumadin clinics across the country. So when you're making your travel plan, you need to go ahead and make sure that you've identified the Coumadin clinics that you will want to travel to in your, on your destination and on your journey. That's kind of exciting and I've met a couple of, um, of uh, older folks that have traveled. In fact, if you look back at one of my videos, I met John who was 80 years old and had atrial fibrillation and also was being monitored on Coumadin and John traveled the country. Um, and I'll, I'll link that video here if you haven't had an opportunity to take a look at it. It's two parts, the interview and the tour of his trailer. In any event, to, to summarize what John did is he ended up going to um, different hospitals across the country and was able to have his Coumadin te levels tested um, every, I think it was every week or every two weeks without any issue. It just takes a little bit more planning and a little bit more um, identification of, of where you need to go in terms of your travel. If you're traveling from New York State to, you know, Utah, all along your route, map out the hospitals and map out the clinics that you need to go to and you stop at uh, in your destin on your destinations and on your journey. It's really not hard to do, it just takes a little bit of additional planning. Alright, so let's summarize. If you have a chronic illness um, and you want to travel, there is really no reason why you shouldn't. I would recommend, number one, that you sit down with your physician and you go through your health care plan and your plan of care to see what challenges that your physician believes you might face if you're on the road. Number two, if you make the decision to get on the road, make sure that you're able to get a renewal on your prescriptions that will last you for at least six months. Number three, if you have a chronic issue that requires routine maintenance and monitoring such as Coumadin uh, or some other type of, of treatment therapy, then when you're doing your travel plan, make sure that you map out in your journey each stop to uh, the clinic or to the hospital where you might need to spend a couple of days to get your testing done. Finally, number four, above all, listen to your heart and listen to your gut. It's very important that you have your preparations made to get on the road so that when you get on the road you can enjoy it. You can live the dream and know that your health is well taken care of. So that's for my folks that are thinking about traveling but not sure what to do. Now, pay attention to the next section because this is going to be for my folks who are already on the road and I want to make sure you're ready for an emergency. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is managing your health history. Um, if you're traveling on the road in an RV, you're going to be going to communities where you haven't been, you don't have medical care coverage in that area perhaps, or you don't have a physician in that area. And so it's important that you have your health history written down. So the first area is managing your health history. So go into your computer and sit there and type out your health history. And I'm going to show you how to do that right here. All right, let's go ahead and put together our medical history. Here you can see we have a medical history and it's it's simply on Word. That's all. It's right up here on Word. Whoops. Okay, and it says for, and I said somebody that lives in an RV, you want to put your name here, okay, and your date of birth as and along with your allergies. Now this is very important to put your allergies because that will tell the emergency response workers or the EMS, the paramedics, and the EMTs in the event that you do have allergies in case they want to be able to give you something prior to getting you to the hospital. So it's very important that you identify your allergies. Now in some cases they may ask you for your weight as well. And so we'll go ahead and put weight on there. And ladies, please be honest because you never know. Okay, the next thing we want to do is we want to talk about medical conditions and recent surgeries. So let's just say that in 2004 you were diagnosed with congestive heart failure. And also let's say that um, in 2005 you had some heart issues and the doctor put in a stent. Now if you don't know where the stent was placed in your coronary arteries, that's fine. Just identify that you have a stent. It's going to help EMS know that you do have some cardiac perfusion of your heart. So it's going to be very important that you put that information in there. Now, of course, if you know that you had a stent in the right coronary artery, then go ahead and put RCA for right coronary artery. And let's just say that later on in 2000, 
2005, you had a few more cents, and maybe you've lost track of how many you have. You can say multiple. Multiple cents. That way EMS knows that you have more than one. And let's say in 2007, you were diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. Okay, you identify atrial fibrillation. And then finally, let's say in 2010, the doctor diagnosed you with type 2 diabetes. All right, this is very helpful information for your EMS when they come out to um, stabilize your situation in the event that you are truly in an emergent situation. Now, obviously, if you've had um, stents, then we know that you've had some kind of stent surgery. So we want to go ahead and put in there 2005 that you had stent placements. Now, um, if you have atrial fibrillation, um, sometimes they provide you with specific types of medications. So it's going to be very important that these medications are going to be listed down here in the medication reconciliation. And we'll get into that in just a second. All right, so that's really what we want to do for our history. Clearly, if you have a more extensive history, then you'll want to make sure that you put in here that extensive history. Don't forget your date of birth. Let's just say you were born on 4-5-1945. Uh, okay. And let's say you have um, an allergy to Ambien. Um, you can put Ambien down. And let's say you weigh, you're a male and you weigh 185 pounds. That information is very important for EMS. All right, so let's talk about medications and how medications are reconciled and managed. Now, if you have to call the emergency medical system, such as an ambulance, or you have to go to the emergency room, the first thing they're going to ask you, aside from your health history, which you've already compiled, is what medications are you taking? And for most of us anymore in today's medical world, uh, people are taking a lot of medications. So having a medication reconciliation list is something that's very important for people who live in an RV. So my recommendation for you is to have a list of medications where you identify the name of the drug, the dosage of the drug that you take, how often you take the drug, and the last time you took the drug. Um, on a document that you can place in your RV in an envelope that says emergency. And what happens with that is you can go ahead and pull that emergency envelope or your partner can pull that emergency envelope off wherever you have it located, whether it's on your refrigerator, whether it's on a bulletin board, whether it's kept at your front entrance, wherever it is, in the event of an emergency where there's no time to think, they pull the emergency envelope and it has your health history in it and it has your medication reconciliation in it. These are the two very important issues in the event that you have an emergency. All right, let's go ahead and start listing off some of your medication. So because you do have atrial fibrillation, it's more than likely that you're on Coumadin or you're on some other type of anticoagulation or blood thinner that helps to prevent you from having any kind of blood clots as a result of the atrial fibrillation. So you want to go ahead and identify the name of the medication here and then the dose and strength. Now, if you're on Coumadin, you know that you might take 2.5 milligrams uh, on Mondays, Wednesdays, um, Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays, and you might take five milligrams on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. So let's go ahead and list both doses. And then under frequency, we're going to go ahead and we're going to identify our 2.5 milligrams are on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays, and our five milligrams are on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Okay, we should do this so we don't confuse people. Now the next part of this that's very important is identifying the route and most likely you're taking this medication by mouth. Now I would leave the last time taken blank because when EMS comes to your RV to pick you up, they're going to ask you when the last time you took this medication was or the last time you took any of the medications that we're going to list here today. Okay. Now if you are taking Coumadin, the EMS workers may want to know what your, IN, what your last INR is. So it might be a good idea for you to list under here INR and let's say it was 2.5. 
if you know what your INR is, put it there because that way they're going to know that you're you know either well re either well regulated or they need to be very careful about your risk for bleeding. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Maybe um, the doctor has you on amlodipine or Norvasc. So. And amylodipine or Norvas is normally uh, 5 milligrams, so we'll put 5 milligrams. And let's say you take that um, once a day, so you take once daily, and then you take that by mouth. And again, we're going to leave, again, we're going to leave the last time taken blank. And let's say the doctor has you on low pressure, and you take 25 milligrams of low pressure once daily and you also take that by mouth. All right, Finally, finally the doctor prescribed you on metformin for your diabetes and list whatever strength that might be once daily and for, or maybe you take it twice daily. Let's just say you take it twice daily. Maybe you take it once in the morning and then once in the evening and you take that by mouth. Again, you want to leave last time taken blank because that will be filled in when the EMS comes to pick you up. Okay, this is your medical history right here, and this is your medication reconciliation. Remember, these are very important documents that should be placed in your emergency envelope. Okay, so you're having an emergency situation. You've already called the ambulance and you need to pull off your emergency envelope. So let me show you what that might look like. So let's take a look over here. My emergency envelope is on the refrigerator. All I have to do is take the emergency envelope off the refrigerator and I'm good to go. Notice on the emergency envelope I have my GPS coordinates, my RV park, the phone number, the address of the RV park, and I've identified this as my emergency envelope. Now if I wanted to, I could put my emergency envelope right here at the front entrance and just tape it up there and it's taken care of. Wherever you want to put your emergency envelope is really up to you as long as you have it. Okay, I hope that you found this video helpful. Um, there's a couple of points I did want to make though. If you're a single RVer, make sure that you have a key strategically hidden outside of your RV. Um, that way... Um, Somebody might know to look for it in the event that um, the ambulance is called and they need to make access to your RV without damaging it because they will definitely damage it to get in it. Um, the last thing I want to say is that um, if you have a living will or you have other documents that are important um, that need to go with you in the event of emergency, make sure you put those in your emergency envelope as well. That way you have everything ready to go and you're set for um, an emergency situation. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please thumbs up, subscribe, definitely share it with your friends, and uh, let me know in the comments what you thought. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.